Be the guy. Say happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> Yeah, we don't even need a sermon at this point. <laughs> Thank you, Elijah. The title of my sermon today is Another AI Easter. So about 11 and a half months ago, when I started thinking about what I was going to be preaching for this Easter, <laughs> um, it dawned on me that today's sermon is my 17th Easter sermon. Is that, isn't that crazy? I mean, that's just, it's so crazy to me. I mean, I started preaching when I was in junior high school and it just went so fast and, you know, and here we are, right? It's just, it's so crazy. But, you know, I have to be honest with y'all. I mean, we're all family here, right? Um, after 17 years, it's a little hard to find something fresh and sparkly and new to say about Easter. Because, honey, over the years, I have preached on everything in, for an Easter sermon from biscuits to baseball to Elvis. I did an environmental sermon one time called um, Resurrection, Just Add Water. Um, a couple of years ago, I did one called Stop in the Name of Love. And thanks to one of our live stream viewers, Paul, that you saw in the, in the video, who's out in California, we got connected with the songwriter of Stop in the Name of Love, Brian Holland of Holland Dozier Holland, the big Motown team. And he came in live for the Easter sermon. I mean, where am I going to go from that? <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago, I was whining to Aza about this. I don't have anything for my sermon. I got nothing. I can't think of what to say. And Ozzy just started laughing, and he goes, Sah, just get an AI chat bot to write it. <laughs> I was like, what? And then I thought about it. Um, most of you know, I mean, you've heard about artificial intelligence, AI. It's all over the news, right? Um, you know, it's sort of the new generation Siri. Uh, for the old school folks, it's like, that computer name Hal in A Space Odyssey, right? Do you remember that? And it's being used for everything from research and development to medical work to people using it to write a term paper. And so I just looked at Oz and I was like, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, and then I went home and downloaded an AI app. <laughs> and on your phone, these days, you can find a little artificial intelligence app. Mine is called Chat AI. And so I felt like we should get to know each other. You know, all you do is you pull it up and you type in a question and it answers it. Any question you can imagine. So my first question was, what is your name? And it immediately goes, bloop, and it goes, my name is Chat AI, but you can refer to me as Chat. Great. We're on a first name basis, this feels good, I feel comfortable. And then of course I had to kind of lighten things up and I'm like, do you know any good Easter jokes? And immediately it comes back with one, some I can't even repeat, some I didn't understand, um, but one was like, what do you call a, an Easter rabbit with fleas? Bugs Bunny? I mean, you know, yeah, I know. That's where I started getting scared about this thing. But, but then I'm like, okay, well, let's just ask him, her, I don't even know what, what this chat box is, but I said, so give me an idea for an Easter sermon. Yeah. And this is what I got. I'd be happy to help with that. Easter is, of course, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the hope of new life that it represents. You could explore the idea of how resurrection was a fulfillment of prophecies. Another angle might be to examine the various reactions to the resurrection. Disbelief to awe. You could also focus on the human response to the resurrection and how it inspires us to live our lives with faith, hope, and love. Ultimately, the message of Easter is about renewal. <laughs> and the people said. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is a smartly organized grammatically correct, factually accurate Easter sermon. <laughs> but did you notice that there's one huge thing missing in this factually accurate message? 
Emotion. Emotion. I mean, this is just sort of a clinically sterile sermon based on data and programmable information. I mean, AI can tell you the history of Easter. It can cite the, every bit of the Bible to you front and back. But AI, chat, can't feel. I mean, chat never experienced the emotional matrix of Easter the uniquely human feelings of grief and fear and betrayal and anger and despair. Chat doesn't know what it means to feel vulnerable, to to risk believing in something or someone. Chat doesn't know what it feels like to step out in faith, knowing you may be hurt, but doing it anyway because your heart tells you it's the right thing to do. For AI, for chat here, the gospel is just a flat, objective spouting of facts with no investment, no commitment, no heart, no feeling. No offense, sorry. (laughs) And my concern is that we have all gotten to the point where the Easter story, it's just data and information. Like artificial intelligence, we can tell a factually organized, accurate Easter story. We can cite chapter and verse from the Bible, but do we truly feel it anymore? Or are we just celebrating yet another AI Easter? Researchers and academics are in such frenzied discussions these days about how the human race has become desensitized to life. They use phrases like psychic numbing, collective trauma, mass desensitization. I mean, part of it is just the brutal nature of life these days. Can I have an amen? Amen. I mean, every one of us sitting here watching Walking up and down the streets on Madison Avenue, every one of us is facing some kind of battle. I mean, whether it's money issues or aging parents or tectonic transitions or mental health or physical loss or relationship breakdowns, maybe it's worries about family or existential doubt or what seems like a bottomless depression. And it's not enough that we carry our own crushing pain, but thanks to the exponential increase in our ability to transmit information, we are also bombarded by the pain of the world. I mean, turn on the news, and everything from war casualties to weather casualties come right at us. The demise of the environment to the demise of our democracy, soaring inflation to soaring temperatures. Life today, I think it feels a bit like the opening of this year's Oscar-winning movie, All is Quiet on the Western Front. Anyone see that? The scene opens where the boys are crouched in their World War I bunker with bombs and bullets just flying everywhere. That's what it feels like. Now... When you start using war metaphors in your sermon, you know it's getting a little heavy. So let's take a quick story break, shall we? Recently, I just bought the most fabulous book. Then I said I bought it for the kids at MABC, but I bought it for me. What am, who am I kidding? And it's called The Day the Crayons Quit. I just found out that Alex's friend is the author of this book. We had no idea. So so hilarious. But it's this great story about a little boy named Duncan who has a box of crayons. And one day, Duncan goes to open the box, and all he finds are letters from the crayons. All about how stressful it is to be a crayon and how nobody seems to care. Like, for example, here's the blue crayons letter. The blue crayon talks about I get used all the time to the point where I am so worn down I can't even see over the railing of the crayon box anymore. I know, it is so sad. And then here's the one that really hit me, the gray crayon. And I'm just going to read you the letter because it's just says it all. Dear Duncan, gray crayon here, you're killing me. 
I know you love elephants, and I know that elephants are gray, but that's a lot of space to have to color all by myself. And don't even get me started on your rhinos and hippos and humpback whales. You know how tired I am after handling one of those giant things, those big animals? Baby penguins are gray too, you know. As are tiny rocks, pebbles. How about one of those once in a while to give me a break? Your very tired friend, gray crayon. I completely get it. And I saw heads nodding out there as I'm reading this. You know, we are all worn down, begging for a break. Many of us feeling we are so worn down we can't even see over the top of the box of the crayons. And so just to get through the day, we step back from the pain and we hunker down and we become numb and we stop feeling. And here's the problem with that. When we lose feeling, we lose empathy. And let's make no mistake, empathy is the fundamental building block for a moral and just society. Let me offer a harsh example. A recent Gallup poll showed that roughly one-third of this country doesn't think there's a problem with race relations. One third. That's 110 million people in this country that don't believe there's an issue with race. Hard to believe. But then again, that's what happens if you numb yourself to the pain in the world around you. This is complicated by the fact that there are many in this country that want us to stay numb. Since 2001, for example, 35 states have enacted 137 bills limiting what schools can teach with regard to race, American history, politics, sexual orientation, and gender identity. It's been called a minefield for educators who are trying to figure out how do you teach things like slavery, Jim Crow laws, or the Holocaust. One proposed law in South Carolina, for instance, prohibits teachers from discussing any topics that create, quote, discomfort, guilt, or anguish on the basis of political belief. We are steeped in systems that want us to stay numb to the pain. Last Tuesday, April 4th was the 55th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. The tragic coinciding with Easter was not lost on my friend Reverend Ken Sahesta, a Baptist minister down in God's country, Asheville, North Carolina. This week he wrote a powerful piece about how our hearts have been hardened to both Jesus's and Dr. King's legacy. He said, quote, we have all suffered memory loss as to Easter's threat and Dr. King's critique. By disremembering and sugarcoating our history. And then he raises these questions applying to both Jesus and Dr. King. How has it become so common to respect the man but relinquish the mission? To revere the dreamer but renege on the dream. <laughs> He's right. We have become numb. But here's the thing. It's not that we have forgotten how to feel. I mean, for example, where are my Taylor Swift fans? Okay, the whole congregation, yes, thank you. Do you feel anything when you listen to her music? Who's here is watching the series Succession? The entire world, yes. Bring out any kind of emotion when you're watching that? Sports fans, feel anything when you're watching the Mets or the Rangers or the Giants playing or when Duke goes down? Yes, you do. How about movies? 
Did your heart rate change when you watched Top Gun Maverick? <laughs> Did you feel a gut punch when you watched 12 Years a Slave or Parasite? And if you haven't watched those movies, you need to watch them. Was there a glimmer of a tear at the end of It's a Wonderful Life? Or in Rudolph, when Hermie the Elf gets his dentist degree? <laughs> If you didn't cry there, then honey, there's no hope. I'm only going to just sit down. <laughs> and if you still need to test to know whether you can still feel, then you pull up the YouTube recording of our Good Friday concert. The choir and the special guests and Ozzy just ripped the roof off this place, and everyone in that audience here on site and watching felt something powerful. It was palpable. Friends, it's... Not that we've forgotten how to feel. We know how to feel. It's that we have forgotten how to feel for each other. There is a proverb that is said to have originated in the country of Ghana, and it says, it is not wrong to go back to that which we have forgotten. Our Easter story today that Elisha read so beautifully helps us do just that. And today I want to focus on Mary Magdalene. I want to focus on her in the story. Here we are three days after her Lord has been brutally executed, and you know she was exhausted, numb from shock, overwhelmed, overloaded, probably in denial, not so far off from the emotions that many of us feel today. And yet what did she do? Did she stay hunkered down in the safety of her house? trying to protect herself, trying to desensitize herself from the pain she had just experienced? No. She turned back into the pain. She went to the place of her greatest pain. She returned to the tomb. And when she gets there, she sees the stones rolled away and Jesus is gone. And the tomb is empty except for two angels who are sitting where Jesus' head and feet would have been. Now, I, we just need to pause for a minute and think about that image. Angels in the tomb where Jesus' head and feet would have been. In Jesus' greatest place of pain in that tomb, he was flanked by angels. And for those of you who think angels are just some fluffy thing on a Hallmark card, honey, think again. Because the Bible describes angels as strong and powerful, as mighty ones. The Bible describes them as warriors. And so here we are, Mary standing at the door of the empty tomb where two warrior angels are sitting. And Jesus appears. But Mary doesn't recognize him. But Jesus sure recognizes her. He speaks to her and says, woman, why are you weeping? Who, whom are you looking for? And she still doesn't know who he is at this point, which I find fascinating because it's not the sound of Jesus' voice that triggers her recognition. It's the next thing he does, which is call her by name. Jesus says to her, woman, why are you weeping? She thinks he's the gardener. And she says to him, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've taken my Savior. And Jesus says to her, Mary. And in that second, she sees him. She turns. She recognizes him and says, teacher, Rabuni." It's in that moment that the presence of the risen Christ when he calls her name and she answers him, that is the moment that the transformation of the world begins. Friends, we might have all heard this story a hundred times. I mean, Frida, you have literally heard it a hundred times. <laughs> our, <laughs> our own Frida Lane, who is a hundred years old, God bless. You've heard it a hundred. We've heard it what we think is a hundred but if we give it an opportunity to speak fresh every year, it will bring a fresh message. And this is the message it brought to me this year. From the place of our greatest pain, we are flanked by angels. And in that place of pain, Jesus is calling us by name to be transformed. 
If you've ever walked around the neighborhood of our church, you may have noticed a statue down on 31st Street at the Church of St. Francis of Assisi. It's almost hidden by the front steps of the church, and if you don't look closely as you're rushing to go get your train or run your errands, you're going to miss it. But if you look closely as you walk by this church, you'll see what appears to be a homeless person sitting cross-legged on the sidewalk with his right hand held out as if asking for food or for help. And if you look even closer, you will notice that there is a nail mark in that hand. Above the statue was a plaque that reads, whatever you did for one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. Travis, could you show us an image of that, please? You may recognize this, some of you walking over to Penn Station. And so this week I had the great idea that I was going to go and put my iPhone on a tripod, set it on the time lapse, and film the rush of people walking back and forth in front of this statue, this powerful image, and not even noticing. And so it was going to be my big dramatic ending today for the sermon. And I go over there with my tripod, and I'm walking along, and all of a sudden I get close enough, and I see there is something around the statue blocking it. And I'm like, great, there goes the ending of the sermon. But then I realized it was a man. He had his grocery cart beside him. He had his coat pulled up over his head. One shoe was off. There was a bottle laying next to him. And as I got closer, I realized he was curled up in a little ball in the lap of that statue. I couldn't help but think about the words from Handel's Messiah from the book of Isaiah that we heard on Friday, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Friends, from the place of our greatest pain, Jesus is calling us. In our exhaustion, in our overload, in our numbness, in the stress and the anxiety, the depression, the addiction, the sleepless nights and the shame and the chronic pain and the injustice and the loss, the risen Christ is calling us by name and he is flanked by angels. And when we answer him, we will be transformed. But remember, the story doesn't end there because as our scripture tells us, Jesus then turns to Mary and says, go and tell the others. And by that, Jesus did not mean go and share the facts and information and data about what you've just seen. He meant go and share the experience of transformation you've just seen. So today we all face a decision about what kind of life we want to live. Do we want to live a life hunkered down in a bunker of safety trying not to feel, trying desperately to protect ourselves, desensitizing ourselves, staying arm's length from the pain worldwide? Or do we want to follow the call of the risen Christ into the place he chose to enter the world, the full, the raw, the exquisitely beautiful and excruciatingly painful human experience? Friends, we cannot afford another AI Easter. Our world cannot survive without some semblance of empathy among God's people. It is up to us to answer God's call to feel for each other. It is up to us to listen to God's call to love one another. It is up to us to go and tell others of the good news of the resurrection. So let us start today, right now. Like Mary, let us take the transformation that we have experienced here today from the risen Christ out the doors of this church and into the world. Let us take this good news out into Manhattan and to Brooklyn and Bronx and Queens and New Jersey. Let us take it out to San Rafael in California. Let us take it to Sharon Springs, New York. Let us take it to Paris, France and to Little Bookham and to Nottingham, England. 
Let us take the good news and that transformation to Vietnam, to Oaxaca, Mexico. Let us take it to Daegu, South Korea. Friends, we have seen the risen Lord. Let us take that joy and share it with the world. And the people said,